It's uh, my joy to introduce you this morning uh, to Greg. Greg Pickle is no stranger to Grace Community Church, though he may be a stranger to you if you've recently started attending. Greg grew up in Knoxville area, attending church throughout his childhood. However, it was later he would come to a saving faith in Christ while midway through his time at the University of Tennessee. Then he went on to the Master's Seminary, and then he spent the next five years serving here at Grace, completing the XL Ministry Pastoral Internship and being pastor of church planting. With the need and the desire of our elders to plant biblical churches, Greg, Brian Beamer, and about 10 other families were sent out around 2013-2014 uh, to plant what is known as Grace Bi Crossway Bible Church in West Knoxville. Grace, uh, Greg serves there now as a teaching elder. Greg is married to Tracy, and they have four children, a son and three daughters, outnumbered. And so personally, I've come to love Greg and his teaching. My first thoughts always go back to my first Grace Community Church Youth Camp that was held in Georgia as Greg taught on Matthew 16 and Peter's confession on who do men say that I am. And I had the privilege of sitting under his teaching as part of the inaugural Shepherds Institute as he co-teaches in that ministry as well. Please make welcome Greg as he comes to bring the word. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it is good to be back as always. I find my way over here from time to time, uh, usually for youth Bible quizzing, which doesn't really involve me other than watching. Uh, but it's a joy to be back here with you this morning. Uh, I do want to greet you on behalf of Crossway Bible Church. Uh, they didn't tell me. I don't know that many of them knew that I was coming. I think they're okay with me being here. But uh, I do want to greet you on their behalf. Uh, we feel there that we are of uh, one mind and one heart uh, with the church here, not just having been sent, but in the, the biblical convictions that we share, the ministry purpose that we have, the desire to see Christ honored through, uh, through the Word of God. Uh, in all its fullness and sufficiency, being what shapes the church, and uh, God, by His Spirit, shaping the church to be what He wants in that way. And so, it's our uh, our desire to do what you desire to do here. And uh, uh, it's good to be it's good to be back in this setting. I feel at home. Uh, the seats in our auditorium where we meet are the same color for one thing, the red, but also everyone's sitting in the middle and over to this one side, just like we have there because the entrance is on the side and no one wants to go over here. So I spend most of my time looking this way. So this is a, my neck is in the right position as uh, to <laughs> permanently, I think, to be able to speak to you this morning. To be here for, uh, for something like this, to have men together seeking to grow, uh, I don't know if you came just for the food and you want to grow physically through that or not. Uh, we certainly would have no trouble doing that, would we, if we just simply ate what was here. But, uh, but wanting to grow spiritually and wanting to be together and wanting to, uh, to be encouraged by one another and to take advantage of the opportunity that you have through a ministry like this. Uh, this is important. And not just important, uh, but vital. Not that you have Saturday morning necessarily, not that you... Uh, do the particular form of study that you're doing, but the fact that you get together and that you are intentionally in one another's lives as men is something that is vital to your life as a Christian, which I hope to show you this morning. I remember looking up directions to a church that I was attending for a conference once, and uh, on that you go to Google Maps, and uh, on Google Maps there are Google reviews, and someone commented about the church. The church had a five-star rating, which I guess is encouraging. But one of the reviews said, this church will get in your life. And whereas many people in the world might not like that very much because that's invasive and there are things that we like to hide from people, uh, someone who wants to honor the Lord can take great joy in the fact that other people won't simply let you do whatever you feel like doing, but that they you 
they're going to be involved with you. They're going to look out for you. They're going to care for you. They're going to rescue you as a lost sheep if you stray. They're going to encourage you according to the need that you have. And I hope that this morning will be an encouragement to you to do that just by being present with one another and then also through what we look at in the Word of God. So I'm encouraged that you're here, and I hope that this will bear much fruit just uh, by being together here this morning. Well, uh, I want, if you would, take your Bibles with me, if you have them, uh, and turn to the book of Philippians and chapter 3. Uh, when I uh, learned that you were doing uh, something on discipleship and discipling one another, and uh, then also studying the book of James, uh, I scoured the book thinking, uh, what would be the most appropriate thing there? And my mind just ended up being uh, drawn back to another place, to this one text in Philippians chapter 3. So I hope that this will be uh, helpful for you this morning. Philippians 3, and there is one verse, verse 17, that I want to read as we begin our time. Philippians three seventeen, Paul says, Brethren, join in following my example, and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Let me throw the question out to you, and you can actually feel free to answer. When you want to learn how to do something, what are the various ways you can go about doing that, that you can learn how to do something? If you're going to take on a project or learn a skill, what are some of the ways you can bring that about? YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. Is there any other way? I think that's all you need, isn't it? You can ask someone. Read. Go to the expert. Yeah. And uh, maybe even taking some of those a little bit further, when you go to the expert, when you ask someone, you know, they can give you directions, they can give you instructions, they can, they can tell you what to do, and you can know this in the abstract in your mind, but what if they showed you how to do it? What if you watched them actually go through the process, and then they said, here, you do this, and then you tried to do it on your own? That might be more effective or at least one of the many tools in your learning toolbox that you could bring about, or that you could use to make sure that, that you're learning the most effectively. Well, a lot of times I think that we miss out on the full-orbed ways of learning that are provided to us <clears throat> as believers. We know that the Bible is there and the text of Scripture is there, and we should learn it all the time. We should read it. We should listen to it being spoken. But I think sometimes it's neglected the example of getting other people involved in our lives in a way where we actually observe them doing what we see in black and white on the pages of Scripture, and we miss out on an opportunity to learn how to put things into practice in a way that is most effective and most mature. And uh, we don't have those visual examples in our lives that we need in order to make sure that we're doing what we can to the greatest extent to honor Christ. So what I want to argue for this morning is that you need to have examples, as Paul points out here, and you need to strive to be the kind of person that can be an example for other people to follow, to look at. Um, very often, in, in uh, if you want to use the word circles, that would honor the Word of God in its proclamation, it can be easy to, to uh, restrict your intake of the Word of God only to what takes place in preaching or formal studies or those kinds of things. And uh, unfortunately, that leaves out what this text is talking about. There is more going on than that. And, uh, and the, the wide range of options available to listen to things online, to watch videos, the, the wonderful resources that are out there can lead people to view Christian learning in sort of a preaching center mentality. We're just here because the teaching is good, and you should make sure that it's good. That's non-negotiable. But how are you taking advantage of the lives of people who have been affected by that teaching in order to actually learn how to do what's involved in what is taught? So as we look at this text this morning, we want to see how Paul tells us how we should think and live. There are all kinds of things pushing us toward doing what we should not think, thinking what we shouldn't think, living what we shouldn't live. There are, there's the influence of other people who don't follow Christ, and that's strong, isn't it? 
There is the influence of our own sinful flesh, the difficulty of having desires that remain and that you must put to death all the days of your life. There is, of course, satanic deception in the form of false teaching in the church, false methodologies and practices. So if we're going to walk in a way that is faithful, then we really have to take advantage of all the resources that God has provided. And of course, this includes the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, and all the truth that we need is found in God's all-sufficient word, but part of God's all-sufficient word is to give us instructions about the very idea that we're talking about of godly example, setting it and following it. We need one another for this. It's not enough to simply hear what is taught. It's not enough to just download something. It's not enough to read books on your own. Those can be wonderful things, but we need to show other people and see in other people how it is that we are to follow Christ. And I think you'll see that as we work through this one verse from another, uh, a number of different angles. So here's the instruction that Paul gives. Uh, if you want to know what the main point of what he's saying here this morning is, we must both follow godly example and look for examples among others who do the same. Um, perhaps I need to rephrase that. We, we must both set godly examples and also look for others among people who set those godly examples. So it's our responsibility both to strive to be the kind of people who can be followed and then also to seek out other people and to look at them and to observe them and to make sure that we are walking after the pattern that they have set of Christ's likeness. This is a responsibility. This is an instruction. And this is something that we are all bound to do. And it's a privilege of being able to get other people helped along the way of becoming more like Christ. Now, concerning this godly example, I want to give you uh, three details of what that looks like. This morning, so uh, just kind of look at this from these three angles. I want to look at the language that Paul uses and how that helps us to understand uh, this, this concept of setting and following an example. So the, we'll look at the language. Then we're going to look at the reason why we do it, the purpose of having examples and modeling. What's the goal of all of this? What are we actually after in following one another? And then I want to talk a little bit about the pursuit of this. What do you actually need to do to get involved in this process? What does this look like on a practical level for you to take part in? And uh, hopefully one of those ways will be what you guys are doing here this morning and what you're, what you're kicking off, but uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. So I want to start by looking at the language of godly example that's described here, the language of godly example. Um, he he uh, writes this verse, the Apostle Paul does, from imprisonment at Rome, by the way. If, uh, if you're not familiar with the book, I trust most of you are. But uh, for those that may not be, he is writing this uh, during his first Roman imprisonment. And he is writing to a church that was very dear to him. And he uh, is concerned that they would not be drawn astray by certain people who would, uh, who would boast in outward things, put confidence in the flesh, that they would, uh, that they would be legalistic. In what they're after, he says that he himself has every reason to boast in those things, and yet he chooses not to. Instead, he boasts in Christ. And he's warning them to watch out for people who pervert the gospel of God's grace, and instead they measure themselves by external things. Now, Paul is not opposed to effort, but he is opposed to self-righteousness. And so he says in verse 9, I want to be found in Christ not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. But at the same time, this doesn't mean that he can just live any way he wants, and neither can his readers, because in verse 16 he says, however, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So he encourages not a trust in your own self, but in Christ, but then an effort that aligns with that, that aligns with whatever level of maturity and understanding that you have reached in Christ and continuing to walk along that pattern. But now in verse 17, he makes it even more comprehensive, and he draws their eyes back to himself. Look at what he says, join in following my example. And observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us, me, and those who minister to you. And there are two key ideas here in this verse when we talk about the language. The two key ideas, and one of them is, first of all, imitation. Imitation. 
There is a concept here of imitating someone else. You notice the word following my example, these three words here. Um, This is the idea of joining together with one another to be the same as Paul is. It's a little bit hard to to, uh, note who he's joining with. If you look at the language here, um, one translation helpfully renders it this way. Join with others in following my example. So he's not so much saying, join in with me, although he wants to do that, but he's encouraging them, encouraging them all. I want you all to do the same thing. Follow me. Do what I do. Uh, if you've ever been involved with uh, children's music class, anybody been involved in one of those growing up or anything, what happens? The teacher's up there, and what's, what's the teacher doing? Doing the motions, and this is what we do, and we have this song, and everything goes with it. And what is the class supposed to do? They all do the same thing. Right? If they're not... The teacher stops and gets on to him. Johnny, stop doing that. You need to pay attention. You need to do what everybody else is doing. This is the same concept here. Paul says, I want everybody to mimic me. All of you. Don't join together against me. Don't do your own thing. But I want you to take what I'm doing and all of you be united in your pursuit of following my example. That is to say, if you're going to be godly, you have to do what he does. A bold statement, but... We'll see in a moment why he makes it. So here he says, join in following my example. Literally, become fellow imitators of me. Imitate me together. It's often said, isn't it, that imitation is the highest form of flattery? That's not what Paul's after. But according to this verse, if you find the right person, imitation is also the path to the highest form of godliness. Because you're following someone who is on the path of following Christ. This is the way. Do what he does. Look at what he says. Look at how he acts. Look at how he thinks. And pursue that path. Find someone, in this case the Apostle Paul, and join in following his example. Now he also uses another term here that we will refer to as modeling. There is not just uh, imitation, but there's also modeling. He says, observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. Uh, The pattern. This is the idea of example or a form of something, maybe a shape, uh, a mold, if you will. And uh, the concept is similar to something that is to be imitated, but it doesn't so much speak of the act of actually imitating someone else, but more of that there is something that is to be imitated. There's a model there. There is a pattern that is set by someone. And we align ourselves after those who walk according to this pattern. And this makes it much easier to actually do what you're supposed to do. I was working on a puzzle last night with my three-year-old. And uh, you know when you get a puzzle, what's the first thing you do? You put all the pieces out, you dump them all out, you get a flat surface, and then um, you you can get along in there and you want to get all the edge pieces if you're doing it a certain way and then work toward the middle. Uh, But what's the most helpful thing if you're trying to put a puzzle together? What do you need? Yeah, you need a picture, right? You, you, want, you want to put the box right there, don't you? So you can see, this is what I'm doing. So when you have a kind of a brown piece, you know it's on this side, or if it's blue, that's where the ocean is down at the bottom. Or in this case, if there's a castle, it's purple, and it goes up at the top. We didn't have a box. It didn't come with a box. It's one of those wooden puzzles that just has the frame but no outline. Now, this is a, a, chill, a child's puzzle. This should not have been very difficult, but it took us a lot longer than I was expecting because we didn't have anything to base this off of. We just were going based upon what fits around the edge and then how does it line up. And I was letting my three-year-old do a lot of the work, so it took longer than it would have otherwise there too. But it was surprisingly difficult because there wasn't a box. There wasn't a, a, a pattern for us. There was a right answer. There was a right way to do it. And we got it together eventually, but it would have been a lot easier if we had a picture there of what we were going for. And the same thing is true when it comes to walking as a believer. You know, you can figure it all out yourself. You can put it all together. You can, you can have that. But we all know that it's really easy to make a mistake uh, unintentionally if we don't know what we're looking for. If you've ever put together a cabinet, some kind of furniture, if you've ever tried to repair a car, uh, if you've ever done anything where you're putting something together out of the box and you don't have a picture in the instructions that's very clear, How easy is it to get to the end and say, I wonder what these pieces are for. Oh, I guess I don't need those. And uh, you mess the whole thing up. So the idea is that he sets out certain people as people to be watched. 
people to be looked for, people to, uh, to see as models of godliness, models to follow after. And, uh, you know, Paul could have here written a lot more words detailing exactly what he wanted them to follow. You know the Philippians is only four chapters long, and he wrote books four times that length. He could have given a lot more detail about that and said, do this thing and do that thing, and he did in other places, and he spent a lot of time previously with the Philippians that he may have taught them about these things. But here he thinks better than write another set of specifics. Uh, It would be better to point them to a particular type of person and say, watch how this person implements the biblical principles that you've learned. Watch how they follow after what I modeled. Watch people who you know are like me and who follow after this same pattern and do what they do. So there are then the ideas of imitation and modeling. That's the language that we're after. So just when you're thinking about getting around other people, when you're thinking about your interactions in the church, just keep in mind that these are vital elements, first of all, of living as a believer. You need to be able to imitate somebody, and you need to, to have people in the church who are models and who can be those kinds of patterns to go after. Now, you say, I don't have anybody that's going to be perfectly doing that. I don't always know who to imitate. We'll talk about some of that as we go. But just up front, get those concepts in your head. Imitation and modeling are critical to being able to walk properly before the Lord. Well, if you have those things then, if you're imitating someone, or if you're supposed to be imitating someone, or if they're supposed to be modeling taking place, what is the actual outcome of that is what we want to talk about next. What is the purpose of all of this? We've looked at the language. Now let's think about the purpose or the goal of godly example. If you are getting involved in watching other people, following other people, looking at their lives, setting an example for other people, what should be the end goal of all of this? Why are you, why are you doing this in the first place? And the reason why I, why I want to talk about this is because there can sometimes be bad reasons to seek to do this. There are a lot of people who want to be followed for really bad reasons, aren't there? What are some of the reasons that would be bad for someone to want followers, to want influence? What are they after? Self-adoration. Yeah, worship me. I'm so great. What else? Power. Yeah, you influence other people and get them to do what you want for control, ease. Yeah. What else? Do you use influence for? Money. Yeah. What motivates false teachers in the New Testament? Almost all of it. It's sordid gain. It's some kind of financial thing. Yeah, you can get other people to follow you, and you build up a following, and they listen to you. And then there's another one, which is pride. Pride of thinking that you're better than other people because people follow you. They're like you. We have a whole church full of people that are like this person or that person. Now, we know this isn't what Paul is after. He's not after lordship over people, power. He's not after pride. He's not after getting something out of them. And we know this for several reasons. One of these is that he's demonstrated the love for this church over the course of something like a decade at this point. They are his partners in ministry. They view him as such. He views them as such. He says in chapter 1 that uh, he is thankful for them. Look in uh, verse 7, chapter 1. He says, For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all. Talking about his thankfulness and his joy. It's only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. Here is the Apostle Paul appointed by Christ having seen the risen Lord and he doesn't exalt himself among or above these partners in ministry. He understands that they all play a, their own part. He has a demonstrated love for them. There is partners He's not using them for personal ambition, but rather he cares for them and for their spiritual good. More than this, he has demonstrated a self-sacrificing spirit. What happened when he founded the Philippian church? What went on there? Where did he go? Not after, but during his stop in Philippi. Do you remember? He went to prison, didn't he? He was thrown in jail, suffered, sacrificed. Even here, Paul is not the one who sets the agenda. He's not saying, follow me as I decide what to do. He's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Consistently, that's what he calls people to. And he says that exactly in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. 
be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. So Paul is not after the adoration of people. He's not after building up a following for himself personally. He understands that to follow him versus to follow other people is significant, not because he wants um, to amass numbers to himself, but because he has the truth and others don't, and he warns against that in the verses that follow here in Philippians 3. But he's not out for getting Paulites, people who would follow after him per se. But he recognizes there is an important role he has to play in setting an example, and he recognizes that he has the truth, he has lived in a way that it aligns with what Christ wants, and that if people were to do what he did, they would be godly. They would be following after Christ faithfully. And so it's this that is the basis of him telling other people to follow him. He wants them to be like him, not for his own personal gain or fame or any other self-interest, but he does it because he wants them to live like Christ. Therefore, it's not arrogant for him to say, follow after me. In fact, it would be actually uh, arrogant to point to Paul and say, I don't need you. Listen to this quote. One writer says, uh, as with any complex practice, we can only hope to acquire these skills, disciplines, and habits to the extent that we submit ourselves to the example of those more advanced in the practice. Hence, for Paul and for all Christians, the only arrogance surrounding the language of imitation would be the arrogance of those so formed by the ethos of individualism that they think they can walk the path of discipleship without observing, learning from, and imitating those who are already farther down that path. Quote. It is not proud to set yourself as someone and say, I'm following Christ, and I see here where I'm doing certain things. Maybe even other people have affirmed that to some degree. And I want to encourage you, join with me in doing this. That's not arrogance. Arrogance is saying, I don't need anyone else. I don't need other people in my life. I don't need other people to show me anything. I don't need other people to teach me anything. I don't need to be around others to be more mature. I can handle that on my own. I've got my podcasts. I've got my library. I've got my Bible. I don't need other people. No, we need other people. Every last one of us. Even the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, he says, when I come to Rome, I can't wait to be there because I'm going to impart some spiritual gift to you, but also I want to come so that each of us may be encouraged by the other's faith, both yours and mine. So even the Apostle Paul, as mature as he was, recognized that other people had things to give him and to encourage him with. So we need to guard against arrogance in this idea of discipleship in uh, discipling, setting an example for other people, following after other people, and this whole thing, we need to make sure that we're casting off the arrogance that comes both from being unwilling to let other people teach us and show us, and also the arrogance that would come with trying to use people for the wrong ends. Um, let me ask you, how do you know if you are a proud example of a model or someone who would uh, who would be an arrogant person wanting others to follow them as opposed to a selfless one? What would be some of the distinguishing features of an arrogant versus a selfless model example? Mm. Yeah. You want to, yeah, you want to hide certain things and not let people be aware of those at all. Yeah, you're keeping, you're keeping things away from, from everybody. Yeah? What else might indicate pride in this, in this process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking out for the prestige and the reputation and being known by people, prominent roles. Yeah, yeah good. What else might be a sign of pride? Or a sign of selflessness? How do you know? How do you distinguish? Let me ask you this. If you've been involved with somebody, you ever get impatient when a person doesn't respond to the word that you're showing them as quickly as you would like? Why is that? Is God not working in his timing? 
or is this just a little bit inconvenient for us because they're not doing things the way that we want? Do you ever try to let people know, hey, I'm meeting with so-and-so. We meet here on this day, and we meet here on this day, and guess what? I'm meeting with six people and 12 people, and you want to make sure that everybody knows that you are influencing people. You're taking, you're looking out for other people. These are the kinds of things that you want to watch out for when you're trying to set an example for other people. Do you just preach to them, or do you actually listen and find out what's going on and hear their side of the story and try to draw out what's going on with them rather than just talking all the time? Are you willing to let people tell you when you've done something wrong to them? Or do you just think, I'm the discipler here. They're the immature one. I can do no wrong. Watch out for these kinds of things in this process. Watch out for being arrogant. At the same time, there's arrogance on the receiving end, isn't there? If you're being instructed by somebody, the pride of being unwilling to listen to someone, of being stubborn, of being uncorrectable, of being like the mule that the psalmist warns against, of uh, being unwilling to change, blaming other people for your problems, don't do that. Be humble about this. Well, I mentioned that just to set that in contrast against what Paul sets forth here as the actual real purpose of being involved with other people. And uh, really, those are, there are two things that show up in this passage. There are a lot of larger purposes, such as being made complete in Christ, such as, being, uh, uh, such as observing everything that Jesus commanded. But here in this passage, there are a couple of things that he notes, especially when he says, follow my example. Uh, he's setting that, in, uh, for one, to the con- in contrast to what came before, which is his fighting against this sort of external glorying and in, uh, in the godliness that is external, that is just boasting in the flesh. And he says, instead, what I want you to do is what I do. And look back in verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude or mature, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So there is then a desire to follow Paul in pressing on toward maturity, pressing on toward this resurrection that he is aiming for. Uh, That's what he is after. Verse 11 says this, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. That is his hope, that's his goal, and he wants to be ready for that time to come. So there's godliness is the idea of what he is after. Continuing godliness is what he wants them to follow when he says, join in following my example. The other thing that he's trying to do then with that is to also avoid spiritual danger. So if he's saying, follow after and do what I do, he is setting that against the alternatives of following other people, following false teaching, following people who live ungodly ways. And he even says that in verse 18, he explains why he gives this instruction. He says, for many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Why do you need to observe those who walk according to our pattern? Because there's a lot of other people out there who have their own pattern that you would follow, and you need to make sure that you're picking the right one. Because you really have one or the other. You're going to live according to some standard. Make sure that it's not set by those who set their mind on earthly things, whose God is their belly, he says, whose end is destruction, whose glory is in their shame. So follow my example because that will keep you away from following ungodly, unspiritual, earthly-minded examples. So those are the goals, this godliness, continuing godliness, and then protection from spiritual danger. These are what he's after in this particular passage. Now I do want to talk for a second about uh, just how far this goes because this can be confusing. If you say, follow Paul, Paul says, follow me, do what I do. What are some things that Paul did that you think he would not expect them to say, I must follow Paul in doing this? Let's just take it to an extreme. If Paul says, follow my example, observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us, what are the kinds of things that he is not telling them to do that he himself does? The Barnabas episode? Okay. You mean the the conflict that he had with him? Okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe so. I haven't thought about that one. Yeah. What else? What does he uh, 
telling him, don't do this. Or he's not telling them to do it. Be a tent maker. Yeah. He doesn't say, you need to have my job. You don't need to follow after what I do for a living. What else is he not telling them to do? Maybe go to prison in Rome. Maybe be a missionary, although he's not saying don't do this. Um, There are certain things that are in those kind of categories that are not what Paul is after. He is not saying you are to follow every detail of my life in the sense of the choices that I'm making uh, that are not necessarily right or wrong. That's not what he's after. He, he's after something different. So be careful when you're in this process that you are not too closely imitating or insisting upon people imitating you in these kinds of surface ways. And it can take some kind of discernment because sometimes doing what other people do, even on those external things, can be helpful especially to get you started. For example, following someone else's Bible reading plan can be helpful if you don't know what you're doing until you get some legs underneath you. That can be helpful. Praying for the amount of time that they do or reading the books that they read or going to all the same church services that they do, that can be helpful to get you going, but those are not the particulars that Paul is after here. And so if you're trying to get people to dress just like you, follow your diet, follow your same budget percentages, um, that's not the scope of this passage. That's the stuff that culture made of, isn't it? That's not what he's after. And so that would be going too far with this. But on the other hand, it can be easy to go not far enough. And interestingly, that actually has the same type of manifestations where you say, I'm only going to follow those externals. I'm just going to do what this person does externally, and I'm just going to follow the same practices. But what Paul is after here is not just a copying of the activity. He's actually after a transformation from the inside out. Because notice again in verse 15, let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude. He uses it again in a moment. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you also. The the word here for attitude, it's a constant theme in the book of Philippians, but it means a way of thinking. It means a mindset, uh, a viewpoint. We might even call this a worldview, although we've taken the term a little bit and used it for something slightly different. But this is a This is just the way that you approach things, the the way that you perceive your situations, what you think the point of life is, what what you use to govern the decisions that you make. And so he says your conduct is important. They are walking according to the pattern that you have in us, but your conduct comes from thinking a certain way, having a mindset that aligns with Christ Jesus. It's the opposite of those in verse 19 who set their minds on earthly things. That's their mindset. But our mindset is to be that which is following after Paul's thinking. And then that flows into Paul's example of living. So it's not that we become a carbon copy of somebody else. But it's rather that we apply the same type of thinking to our particular life circumstances that other people who are godly apply to theirs. That may look very different in the end, but it's driven by the same kind of principles. And in a sense, this is much more challenging, isn't it? It's a lot harder than just going and buying the same kind of car or going to the same school or eating the certain kinds of food. It's a lot harder to put aside previous ways of thinking and then to actually think carefully about how to apply that in your circumstances. That's much more difficult, but it's got a much more beneficial outcome. Because when you do this, here's the benefit. This is not going to be something that somebody else chose to do. So-and-so said, I should do this, and therefore I'm doing this. This this is their idea. This is not going to be that way anymore. When you change to think the way a mature person thinks, your life might look a little bit different, but it will be sustainable because now it's driven by what? Internal conviction. It's driven by what you believe, not just by what somebody else is doing. You have changed convictions that lead to a changed life. There's another benefit of this too, by the way, which is that there can be a joyful unity in the church, even where there are differences in the particular application of biblical truth. There will be a non-judgmentalism among the congregation because you would expect that other godly people do different godly things than you do. 
You don't expect their godliness to always have the same exact manifestation as yours. It's not differences in doctrine. That's not what Christ wants. It should be worked through. It's not differences in obedience to clear commands. Rather, it's differences in the way in which you apply biblical principles about pursuing Christ. And this is difficult. It's, it takes discernment. It takes more work. But it's also what he's after here. And it's also the only way to have lasting change and to have joy and unity in the church. So this will work out differently for different people. The way one person receives the word of God with humility as scripture commands may look far different than the way another person does. It may for one person mean you read through the Bible broadly. For another person, at that time, you're reading through one passage intently, but you're both taking in the word of God and thinking about it and obeying it. One person may tell other people about Christ evangelistically through a home Bible study. Another person might go door to door. Another person might go on the street and hand out tracts. Another person might pick up an amplifier. Another person might go online. There's all kinds of different ways, but everybody's trying to do the same essential thing. It just looks different in different people's lives. I guess if you want to put it another way, if we're setting godly example and following godly example, it's not a cookie-cutter approach where all the cookies look the same, but it's the same kind of cookie, same substance to it. We're all doing chocolate chip, but they're going to be in different shapes when they come out of the oven. The essence is the same. It just takes place, takes shape a little bit differently because God has all of us in unique circumstances. But because we have the same core convictions from the scriptures, and that's the place of our focus, and that's what we're learning from other people, then there's lasting real change not just externals. So this is the purpose of modeling. This is the purpose of imitation. It is godly living driven by godly thinking. You have to do what Romans 12, 2 says, and renew your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We love that verse. That's one of the top 10 Bible verses always, every year in the highlights and the surveys and everything. But when it's other people who are instructing us, and saying, hey, I, need to, I think you need to change your thinking this way. We're sometimes a little bit hesitant to do that. We're okay with changing our own mind to some degree, but when it comes to joining and following somebody else's pattern and letting them help us to change our way of thinking, we might resist that. So I would encourage you not to do that. And that's what we're going to talk about now, is this, this third, third detail of setting and following godly examples, which is just the practice of it. How do we practice this? You say, okay, I know that there is such a thing as modeling and imitation. I know that the church is supposed to do this. I know I'm supposed to be involved in this. And I know that this is for Christ-likeness that comes through godly thinking and godly living. Well, what do I need to do to get involved in this? Well, uh, I want to talk about the two sides of this, but just as a baseline, look what Paul says. Join in following my example. My example. We learn about the baseline for all of this from what Paul wrote, what Christ said, what is written in the scriptures, and all that is there in the Bible that gives us the baseline of what godly living, what godly thinking should look like. So we don't just look at a godly person and say, we do whatever they do. We look and we say, insofar as they align with scripture, we do what they do. So that's the baseline. But God, thankfully, does not stop there. He also puts the possibility here that there are others, not just Paul, but other people after him who faithfully follow the pattern which was set by Paul that can be followed then by other people. So he says, observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Observe them. Look at them. And of course, he's not saying here that you just sit up on a perch and look, is he? This is not bird watching. This is not, oh, I'm going to write down in my book and I've got this for my record. This is not just mere observation. This is looking upon people for the purpose of doing what? Following. Modeling yourself after them. Imitating them. So go. Watch their life. Do what they do. See how they think. Follow after them. And So this is the first side of it then. If you want to be involved in this practice, the first thing you need to do is find examples. Okay? Find examples. Where do you find examples? Where are you going to get those? You guys know where you can buy them? Of course you can't do that. Where do you find examples? How do you know who to follow? What's that? This is a good place to start here in this room? Yeah. In this room? Look for godly examples here. Okay. 
What does Scripture say about it? Does it talk about any particular people? Uh, Hebrews 13, verse 7, tells us, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So you can start there, can't you? The leaders that are speaking the word of God to you, if they are allowed to be in such position, it is, uh, the assumption is that they're actually qualified enough to do that, that their life is godly enough to where you can follow them. Start with them and then ask them, hey, who else do you think I should follow after? Because you don't want to necessarily just say, well, I like this person, I'm going to get together with this person because they're fun and we have similar interests. There's a place for that. But just recognize if you're trying to find people to follow, you need to make sure that you're following godly people and not just the person that you enjoy being around. Now, practically, what this means up front is that you're going to have to, if you're going to find examples, you're going to have to have the humility to admit that you need to learn from other people, which is really hard for almost everybody. Um, Christianity is an individually owned kind of thing, but we're foolish if we think that we can live on our own and not get what other people can help us to learn. So we need to have the humility to say, I need what other, what other people give me. I need to be sharpened. I need to have somebody else see my blind spots and point them out to me. I need to have someone to say, what are you talking about? That's not biblical. To, t- to challenge those long-held assumptions that you have. And that's another key element of finding an example is be, being willing to have your thinking and your conduct challenged. Not just saying, well, you know, I've been a Christian for 10 years, so I must have it all together. No, you're always subject to being corrected biblically. And when someone does that, don't say, I can't believe you would have the nerve to do that. But be thankful that someone cares enough about you to actually say hard things at the risk of offending you. And then take the effort. Make an effort to be with other people and glean from other people. Well, nobody invites me to their house. Nobody's asked me to be in a discipleship relationship. Nobody's following or nobody's setting an example for me. You take the effort. He says here, observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. The responsibility is not just on a person to set an example. It's on people to look for examples, to look at them, and to do everything they can to actually find out what they're doing. So what are some ways that you can do that? How can you get yourself in a place where somebody else can actually instruct you on a personal level? What are some tactics? Oh, we're in trouble. I don't think it's going to happen very much. What? Be part of a ministry? Okay. Yeah, be part of a ministry. Get around other people. Serve together. Mm-hmm. What else can you do? Yeah, share a meal. Go to lunch. Invite them out to lunch. Take them out to lunch. Bring them lunch. However, just share a meal somehow. Sure, what else? You go run together. You go play golf together. So that sounds unspiritual. I, I don't think so. You can uh, go do all kinds of activities. Take your family to hang out with their family. Track them down in church and say, hey, can I talk to you? Can you help me out? Ask people how they spend their time and why they do it and why they say the things they do and why they don't do certain things that they do. And and, uh, ask them about trials they've gone through and what they've learned from them and how they would handle them differently and uh, seek to find out the biblical ways that they're addressing those things. Find out the kind of things that they struggle with and what they're doing to work through those kinds of sins and how how they're applying the scriptures to grow in godliness. Try to impress them with how you have it all together. You know the temptation to that, don't you? Mature person, gifted person, and you just want to show them, yeah, you know, I know that thing. Yeah, that thing that you just taught about, I I learned about that in the book, and it was great, and so all you're doing is just telling me what I already know. Don't try to impress. Try to learn. Focus on what you can learn. And then ask them to be honest with you. Make it easier for them to speak into your life, and then don't get offended when they do. So find examples. Look for them. Get involved in one of these groups you guys are doing. Find somebody you can follow after, people that you can follow. And then as you grow, the goal should be that you're not only finding examples, but also while you're learning from other people and never stopping to do that, but also that you can be examples. Be a godly example. Paul says, join in following my example and then observe those who walk according to the pattern 
you have in us. Who is it that's doing that? Well, it's got to be somebody, doesn't it? It has to be somebody. Why isn't it you? Why would you not, if you don't consider yourself somebody that can be a pattern for other people, what's stopping you from being there? Why is that? It's just an issue of spiritual maturity. It's not about giftedness here. He's not saying you have to be a preacher. He's not saying you have to be a missionary. You just have to walk after Paul's pattern to be worthy of being an example. That's not off limits to anyone as a believer. So what's stopping you from doing that? The only thing is immaturity, spiritual immaturity. And uh, if you find yourself in that position, you need to get the train moving. You need to start working to grow. Because it's not just your growth at stake, but other people who depend upon you. Think of, look, at, look in this room and think about people who aren't here yet. People who may be here, if you have more of these every year or every so often, who might be here in five years who could sit here and say, I need to have an example. And you can sit here at that time, five years from now, and say, I'm the kind of person that they could follow. Or you could say, man, you know, I'm just where I was five years ago. I'm the same. I'm not followable. I wouldn't recommend anybody come to me for any kind of spiritual counsel. I, I wouldn't recommend that they live like me. Think about people who will need your help one day. People who could use your help now if you knew certain things and did certain things. And get moving. Grow. Be the kind of people that other people can follow. To where you could say, I'm not perfect, but I'm striving to follow Christ by following godly examples and by doing what Scripture sets out. So I'd encourage you to those two things. Whatever practical measures you have to take to find people to follow and to begin to model your life after godly people and then to work toward being that same kind of thing yourself, making yourself available, letting people know that you can help them. Not that you go to them and say, here, let me help you out, but you make yourself available. You get in their lives and you give them the opportunity to learn whatever you can happen to teach them to. So understand your need for examples. You need to be models. You need to imitate other people. Understand what you're after, which is godly living, driven by godly thinking, and get to work finding people who can model this for you and then growing in your ability to model this for other people. Let's pray together. Uh, we'll be done with this part. Father, thank you for uh, this instruction. And uh, I trust that that uh, we are challenged by the, the inadequacy that we would feel to be examples and models for other people. Uh, and we know that even when we are challenging people, other people, that, to do certain things that Christ instructs, that we are never doing that from a position of having fully mastered those things. And so we pray that you would give us, at the same time, a conviction to speak the truth, no matter what it is and no matter whether implicates us or not, but also a willingness to change and to keep growing more and more and to, to lower the gap between what we know to be true and what we would speak to others and then also what we do ourselves. But we do pray that there would be men in this group who would be godly examples for others to follow and that they would take delight in giving their time and their energy to helping other people grow. We pray that there would be a humility not only on their part, but on the part of other people to seek out help. That there is no shame in doing that, but there is a, a, a faith that trusts your instructions here to get involved with the lives of one another. And I pray that these men would rejoice to do that and that it would, be, it would bear much fruit among not only this group that's here this morning, but also the whole church as well. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.